Well, good morning, everyone. This is Rob Aubrey. I'm your host of a Productive Agent Podcast. Productive Agent Podcast is powered by Aubrey Home Loans. And so today we have our special guest is Annie Trujillo, and she is a top producing agent with Keller Williams. And uh, welcome to the show, Annie. Thank you so much. Thanks for having yeah. me here. No, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's uh, I always say this at one of the, you know, when I strategized this thing, how I was going to do it, and made sure, I made sure I had a list of people that would do it before I even started. And um, a side benefit that I never really thought about was I just get to hang out with cool people all the time. It's uh, mm -hmm. it really is, you know, in this day and age, I mean, we're so disconnected, you know, and I'm literally hanging around. Like I have eight podcasts scheduled between this week and next week. So I get to hang around with eight cool people in two weeks time. You know, how cool is that? Right. So, well, welcome. And tell us, you know, tell us about you. How long have you been in real estate? Uh, so it's been about eight years so far. Okay. Eight uh, years. Been with, yep. Been with Keller Williams that whole time. You've been, okay. The whole time. And then um, what were you doing before real estate? Um, a myriad of things, but most notably, I was a mountain guide for about a decade. I lived in the eastern Sierra of California and took people climbing and skiing and ice climbing. And then I did a little bit of guiding for um, Utah Mountain Adventures here in, in the Wasatch. So how does one go from mountain uh, guide to when I think a mountain guide, I, I think of a a big burly guy with a beard, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah, you're not the only one, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what comes to mind, you know? And so, um, but, uh, so how did you go from mountain guy to real estate? How'd that happen? Yeah. So, um, you know, I moved to, uh, I moved to Utah about 11 years ago. And when I got here, I continued to guide, but learned that this is not really a place that you can guide year round. Most of the mountain guides that work here, travel per uh, season based on where they're at so if you're a you know ski guide you're in the wasatch during ski season but then you right. probably will go someplace else for the spring and the fall right um, and so after a little while i wasn't able to find climbing partners on the weekdays and guiding wasn't something i could do year-round so i decided to get a job so i managed um the front climbing club uh the climbing gym here in the town in town oh i see i set routes for them i worked at the front desk um, scheduled summer programs, became manager, took over their manufacturing uh, segment and all that. So during that time, I bought a house, my first house in Salt Lake, which was a triplex. And I lived in the basement so that it would pay itself off, right. kind of house hacking style. Um, so when my sort of tenure with the front ended, I didn't really have a lot kind of going on. And my realtor, when I bought that place was like, he was an old school climber and he goes, Annie, you should, you should get your license. And I went, yeah, right. Like that's so cheesy. That's such a sellout move. No way. But then I would tell people, I'd say, Oh, uh, you know, Dave said I should get my real estate license. And across the board, people were like, you'd be really good at that. And so I went, well, I don't have anything else going on. Um, so right. yeah, I got my license and it's pretty much been nonstop since then. So I have this big analogy in my life. Um, we're about six months into getting my license. I kind of had this realization that what I actually do is I take people out of their comfort zones. I explain the process along the way. I keep nerves calm. If the weather is bad, I get them out of there. And at the end of the day, we summit a house. I mean, we buy a, we buy right. a house, we summit a mountain, which is it? And right. so I realized that I had sort of the same job I've always had. So I've kind of taken that guide mentality into real estate. And that's been a really great sort of analogy for well, absolutely. my life. Yeah. As you started talking about that, I'm like, yeah, you're just an, uh, you're a guide. You're just another guide. Yeah. You know? Just another I, kind of guide. And I've always said that one of the things that is never really taught, I don't even know if it's explained is the, uh, like a leadership set of qualities to lead people through a process, to guide people through a process. And, you know, you have a family, you know, you have a husband, a wife, you know, three kids, two dogs, a cat and a turtle, and they live here. And the goal is to live here, you know, and how do you, and you have to guide them through the process. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's literally what we do. I always said you have to lead them through the process, but the guiding analogy is perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, that's cool. Well, and and you described it as you were you've done that. You came here and then you became the manager. So there's an old expression that says success leaves clues. So you were successful in that other business. 
And then, but it had its limitations because of seasonalities and whatever, you know, so now you're successful in real estate because mm -hmm. you just bring that same mind. And that's the key, right? It's your, you know, if you're unsuccessful over here, you're probably going to be unsuccessful over here. And that's not a scientific fact. I mean, you may have had a bad advice or whatever, you know, but typically talented people make it happen no matter what they do. And so based on the few things you just told me, you are a talented person for sure. So thank you. Yeah, of course. No, I recognize it. I mean, I was, I've learned, I've been taught to, to listen for clues. And, you know, well, you said you managed and that was, your, that was my clue. Yeah. And, and one of the things I think, you know, I think that unfortunately most people, no matter what field they're in are not very good at their job. And I've always made a point, like you're saying, to be good at whatever it is I'm doing, you know, like sure. if you bag groceries, be the best grocery bagger, exactly. you know, if you're a waitress, be the best waitress. And so when I got into real estate, because I had been a guide in town and because I had managed a climbing gym, I knew a lot of people. And specifically, my theory is that when I took over management at the front, it had been, it was a really small gym back then. It was really dirty. It was run by boys. And right. the first day I came in and overhauled the place. And about six months after I was there, I looked at the numbers with uh, the owner and I was like, look at these numbers. And our membership had doubled at that time because word got around that it was cleaner. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, they had new stuff in there. And so I think that the people that knew me when I got my license you know, knew that I was new to real estate, but knew that I was a hustler and knew that I worked hard and knew that right. I'd be good at it. And so if you can just, if your reputation, if your reputation sort of precedes you, if you can, people like they know you work hard, that's kind right. of, you know, a great place to start. If they go, oh, he was terrible. Cause everybody, my broker always says, everyone failed into real estate. Like nobody was born and went, I want to be a realtor. We all kind of came into yeah, real estate. Very in few way. come right out of college and into real estate, you know? Right. And usually it's because maybe their parents are realtors or something like right. that. But, um, you know, if you're just always good at what you do, when you transition into real estate, people will know that you're going to be good at that too. Right. And that exactly. sounds a little cocky probably, but that's, <clears throat> no, that's my theory. Because I, I did, you know, I trained, I used to be a house painter, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I was a good house painter. I was, because I was trained. My father was a painter. I just didn't like the painting contracting business. So I decided to look for something else. But it's funny you talked about, you know, the gym was dirty and run by boys. You know, I remember years ago, I, I actually still lived up in Salt Lake City, but my office was down on 64th and Highland, you know, so just right there by the freeway. And it was the gym up there. Oh, what's it called? It's right there in about 62nd and Highland. I forget what it's called, but it, it's a popular gym. But anyway. So I went to, you know, I figured, well, it's right down the street from my office. You know, I can go to work out, shower, and go to the office. And so when I went in to look at it, they wanted the the person showing me around said, Can I let me show you the equipment? I said, No, 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 just show me the bathrooms. You know, yeah. she's like, Well, why? I'm like, I want to see how I, mean, I wanted to see how clean they were. If I gotta come yeah. here and shower every day, you know, I don't want to be in some and they were nice, they were clean, they had nice lockers. She says, Don't you want to see the equipment? I'm like, Look, you got all the equipment, right? She's like, Yeah, show me the bathrooms, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I just want to clean, you know, because yeah. yeah, I'm a, I'm a neat, clean person and I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to shower in that run by boys and dirty bathroom, you know? Yeah. So I know I shouldn't say run by boys, but well, it was, <laughs> no, it's, it paints the picture, you know? Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, um, so anyway, um, um, uh, well, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's a good story. So like, tell me about your, so would you say most of your businesses like, repeat referral type businesses that we say. Yeah. 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 Almost a hundred percent. And I've been kind of a weirdo about it. Probably. I, I have this thing where I don't like to work with strangers, so I'm not one for cold calling or door knocking. Um, I don't even really, I shouldn't say this too loud, but I'm even referrals from other agents out of state and stuff like that. I'm always a little bit leery because I've been so lucky in real estate to work with what I refer to as my people sort of like, right cool, like-minded people. Most of my people are like climbers or skiers or mountain bikers. And that has kept me running in this business. So, right. um, but, you know, if I'm working 
with people that I like and enjoy, I'm going to be the best version of myself. And if I'm the best version of myself, they're going to pick up on that and then hopefully refer me to their friends and colleagues. Right. And I'm always like, send me your people because I don't want to work with strangers. <laughs> well, and it creates a good experience for them as well. When exactly. you are your best self, then they, they benefit from that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, I don't like to work with people. I mean, we get them every once in a while. And you're like, oh, they're you know, I give latitude in real estate. You have to give some latitude, you know, because they're wigging out because, you know, they got their house under contract. They haven't found oh, another yeah. one yet. I mean, they're like, oh, they're, yeah, they're it's like stressful. homeless in 30 days, you know. <laughs> yeah. and so, well, and I always say, look, so, you know, they say, um, you know, that moving's like up there with door, divorce and death as far as uh, stressful things to do. But so you take somebody that's, you know, got it because people, why do people move? Right. It's because it's a life situation. Mm -hmm. It's not they just decided one day they were bored. You know, it's something happened, right? Uh, marriage, divorce, birth, death, got a job, lost a job, job transfer, job promotion. You know, kids move out, kids move back, kids move back with kids, you know, <laughs> a aging parents, you know. Yeah. I mean, th these are the reasons people move, health. And so, you know, so they have that and then come along. Then, so they have the major life event taking place. Then you have all the moving and everything that goes along with it. And then you have the financial, let's say you have somebody selling a house for say 400,000 and they're buying a house for 650. Well, and let's say they make, you know, $10,000 a month, you know, combined income. Well, they live in a $10,000 a month world, but they're in the midst. Mm -hmm. So they have the major life event, all the stress of moving. Now they're dealing with one point, you know, uh, uh, over a million dollars in business and they're just freaking out, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's where the guide comes in. Yes. You know, and let me guide you through this process, you know? Yeah, for oh. sure. Yeah. You always see a slightly different version of people within a stressful real estate transaction. Oh and yeah. It's uh, it's sometimes challenging, but always good to kind of like keep empathetic, you know, to the process. Right. There was for a while I was trying to buy a house every year. Um, and there was a period of time that I didn't do that. But during that time I found myself getting more frustrated with people more frequently, you know, I go, oh, like, why are they being like this or what? And anytime I feel myself start to do that, I put offers in on houses. Because right. even if I put a low ball off or something terrible that probably won't get accepted, I'll tell you all day, my armpits are sweating, my palms right, right. are sweating, I'm just yeah. nervous all day. And it's not even hardly a real offer. Right. Um, and the second I do that, I get back into that empathetic mindset and I can be there with people and their frustrations and their fears and all the things they're going through. Um, so it's important for me to sort of reset that every once in a while, because otherwise I'll go, uh, you know, you do it yeah. every day. You're like, it's not that big of a deal. Or you'll be fine. But um, right. Yeah. Yeah. You, don't yeah, you have to approach to, it that way. Yeah. You have to stay away from what I call paperwork and inventory. You know, there. It, you know, for us, that's what we do for a living. Right. That we have inventory and we have paperwork. You know, and it's like, and it's like, no, 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 these are families. These are people, yeah. you know, and yeah. like you said, you have to keep that, you know, and every once in a while you have to remind yourself and give them latitude. Like, I, you know, my rule has always been, well, number one, they have to be nice. That's like my first rule. Mm -hmm. If they're just not, I mean, and we run across them. I'm like, I've turned people down. I'm like, no, I don't want to work with you. And they're like, why not? I'm like, well, you're just, I just, you're not going to treat me right. You're not going to respect me. And, you know, the best thing that could ever happen to me is you work with my competition. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. They're like <laughs> yeah. let me refer you. <laughs> yeah. I got it. Yeah. So when somebody locally calls you up with a referral, you're like, okay, why don't you want to work with them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you hate me. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so that's kind of, you know, if it's out of state referral, one thing, but if it's a local one, you're like, mm. so, but anyway, so, so tell me about like, so, you know, obviously you create a good customer service experience. That's why you're successful. <clears throat> so what would you say are some of the things, you know, you, I mean, you kind of like conceptually touched on, you know, from a, a, a high level view of a good experience, you know, but what are some ideas that, I mean, what are some of the things you do that may be, you know, uh, not everybody does that would you would consider a higher, you know, a, a quality experience? Yeah. So my motto in business is like no surprises. So my goal is to never, ever once have anybody I'm surrounded with go, wait, what? Right. And go, 
I didn't know that, or nobody told me that. Like, that's my nightmare thing for somebody to say to me. So from start to finish, when I'm with people, like when I sit down at a buyer's consultation for the first time, you know, I understand that they might, they might be interviewing other real estate agents. They might be looking at different lenders. And I go, my experience is that if you talk to a realtor, you get the realtor information. If you talk to a lender, you get the lender information. My goal is to marry that information so that again, it's just a no surprises thing. Right. So I start from like sort of an educational background when I meet with people, I'm not trying to sell them on me or like, oh, here's my numbers and what I've done. And this is how many right. times I've sold. There's none of that unless people ask and they never ask. Um, what I'm trying to do is educate them on the process. So I go, if you work with me or you work with another agent, you're going to be better off now because of the things I've told you. There won't be any surprises. Um, and that kind of continues down the line. So like when we're writing a contract, I'm on a Zoom call with them with the contract shared and I'm going line by line through that right. contract so they know exactly what they're say signing. So again, they never come back and go, wait, I didn't know that was part of the contract. Right. And I know that a lot of agents just send, just email <coughs> over the contract for signatures. And Excuse me. To me, that is just a nightmare. So yeah. it's it's always being really upfront with people, explaining every part of the process, you know, and, and repeating those things. Cause it's a lot of information. Right. So people don't always, so I'll refer back. Remember when I told you this, that's what's happening right. now. Remember when I told you that that's what's happening now. Yeah. See, eighty twenty um, rule at the end of that offer presentation, whatever you want to call it, you know, at the end, reiterate the 20% that's most important, mm -hmm. you know, because that, which yeah. is usually the, I always made sure I reiterated, um, you're probably not going to get the keys at settlement table. So don't show mm -hmm. up with a U-Haul truck. I made sure they yeah. understood that. And then I walked through section eight, you know, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, but you mentioned about some agents just send it over. They call that the Apple effect and where people aren't reading. And so mm -hmm. there was an experiment done by a guy in Europe. He was a, a like an app developer and he gave away a free app. And so, and everybody just clicks the terms of service. I agree. But what, what they didn't realize that they agreed to was that they would clean 20 public toilets for this free <laughs> app, you know? I mean, of course yeah. he didn't enforce it, but it, it, it was the experiment to prove that people don't read it. Yeah. Because they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have agreed to scrub 20 public toilets for a, do, right. a 99 cent app, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so, and that, and, you know, and I'm sure there's been cases out there I mean, it's hard to say if you went, I mean, could a buyer take somebody to court and say, well, they didn't explain it to me. Well, did you read it and sign it? Well, I signed it. I didn't read it. Well, I mean, I, it, you'd have a pretty tough leg to stand on in a court of law if you told a judge, well, you never read it. Yeah. But, yeah, I just, but I just had, oh, go ahead. You know, you're, well, I was saying your method covers all that. You know, yes. you're, you're, and, and that's the point is like, I don't ever want to end up in court. in court or questioned. And in fact, just the other day, so I was on the listing side, closed a property. I don't know how the buyer got my number of her agent gave her my number, but she reached out to me directly with a very fiery text at midnight that luckily I did not see until the next morning that was like, you, you know, you didn't disclose this. And I knew that you knew about it. And, you know, this very, and, and I, I was like, what? And so I went straight to my computer, looked up the seller's disclosures, saw that her signature was on it and was like, actually, it was right there in section 2B, you know, that has it. So let me know if there's anything else I can help yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? And to me, I'm like, that's on, I mean, I'm not disparaging that agent because I don't always go over. It's back to the Apple fact. Disclosures, but yeah, but I go, this woman signed this document and she didn't see this thing and then heard from it somewhere else, you know, and came back at me and I'm like, that's right there in the documents. So <clears throat> Yeah. Well, my guess is when they called their agent, their agent said, well, I don't know. And blame, you know, threw you under the bus. Yeah, I, I, that seems doubtful. This agent was actually really great to work with and okay. super professional and seemed on it. But um, I think that, yeah, I don't know if she got my so, number. But, well, it's yeah. easy to find a real estate agent. It is, number. it is easy to find a number, but I, th that was a first for sure to have my not my client reach out to me afterwards for information i was like all right see i would have been all over that i would have taken total advantage of that i would have called them up i would have found out if i could help do anything about it and i would have 
contacted them about eight times in the next three weeks and then moved them into my past client database. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably smart, except that the way that I was being talked to in that text makes me go, I wouldn't want this client. <laughs> so yeah. I was very polite. I answered right. all of her questions because there was other questions. I helped her through what she needed. She later apologized for being That's why I would have made it a phone call. with me. Yeah. Because yeah. she well, the problem with text, me. <laughs> the problem with text is it takes on the tonality of the reader, not the tonality of the writer. Yeah, when there's curse words involved. Oh, yeah. No, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, maybe not. I mean, you know, maybe not. I don't know. I might not yeah. have taken them on, but I agree with you. They're like, ah, I just want to get them out of my system. Yeah, probably. And and I was very professional and polite and answered all the questions and she was happy in the end. And I was like, okay, I agree. Right. <laughs> yep. So. Yeah. Hopefully she doesn't watch this. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, cause we didn't mention any names. Yeah. So. yeah. But, um, so do you do any kind of marketing to your database or anything? Um, not like paid for marketing. So I do a quarterly newsletter to my entire database. Um, that's just kind of a cute little thing. I interview somebody local. It's like this. Sure. Um, and so it's completely like hand curated. Um, right. And I take pride in that. Um, so we do that. I do emails on Fridays, most Fridays. I don't know if I'll do one this Friday. That's um that goes out to my entire database as well. Um, I do a lot of Instagram, social media kind of right. campaigns and things like that, but I don't pay for any marketing or, the, mailers other than the or marketing. anything like that. Uh, yeah. what, what about use the newsletter? You know, you mail that out, correct? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mail that out. I just mean, I'm not like paying, you know, I'm not like on the side of the bus. Right. Know, oh or, yeah. <laughs> wherever. Like our realtor campaign. I'm like, well, I could think of a lot of other things we could do with that money, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, yeah, no, that's, that's pretty common. I hear that, you know, very few, um, you know, I mean, I consider you a top producer then, you know, there's like another tier of like mega producer people doing hundreds of deals, you know, they obviously mm -hmm. spend money on marketing. Yep. There's only so much SOI you can do, but I mean, obviously you're doing well, uh, you close when most people are down, and I don't know if your numbers are down, I didn't look up previous numbers, but you had closed 30 transactions in the previous 12 months. And so that's pretty darn good in a market that people are, you know, are, you know, can't find a deal. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so you're doing well. So, so my well, hat's I, off. I good job. Thank you. Yeah. I can't imagine getting my, and this is probably what everyone says, you know, but I can't imagine getting my license right now and starting in this market. Like the, right. the only reason that I've stayed busy through this time is because I just have that kind of mature, you know, SOI that I can right. kind of ride out through these times. Um, and, and it's maturing in such a way that, you know, a lot of folks bought houses three or four years ago, their first house. And, I cannot tell you how many of my clients are pregnant or with young children right now, you know? Oh yeah. So they all just need to upgrade. So I, I did a big um, panel yesterday actually with some other top producing agents and um, you know, it was mostly built around this idea of uh, scarcity. You know, I think a lot of agents right now are like, Oh, it's a down market and nobody's buying and interest rates are so high. And I don't see that at all. I'm like right. how you were saying earlier, I'm like, people are going to need to buy and sell houses no matter what the market is because right. of divorces and death and babies and all the stuff that you mentioned and earlier. Yeah, And it's like, so be there for them when they're ready for that. And I just so happen to be at sort of an age and position in my career that people now that bought their first time houses are ready to upgrade to their second one. They've gotten raises in the meantime, they're having babies, right. you know, they've saved up, they've, I got a they got equity ton of equity <laughs> a um, bleak ton of equity you know yeah, yeah. sorry <laughs> no it's okay um, they've got a ton of equity in their homes and so they're able to make that upgrade and in fact not even you know the one thing that i think needs to be sort of put out there more are the actual numbers of like you know even though you have this three percent interest rate and now it's going to be six and a half percent interest rate with all the equity you've built up in the you know job promotion a raise you've had in the meantime the payments don't necessarily feel that different and that's what i'm yeah recognizing with these buy sell deals 
is well, that people are like ready for these payments, you know? The other thing is, and I, I just, and I'm going to be launching, I'm going to be doing a, a demonstration today at 1030. It was in my morning. I usually send out an email on Friday, but I send out, I mean, Monday mornings, you get those, but I sent out a special email this morning on Fridays, on occasion on Fridays. So, but I have a tool uh, called Doesn't Make Sense, a web page on my website. And so what it does, it has three calculators. So one is equity calculator, which is simply, you know, uh, value minus debt equals equity. And then the second calculator is a debt calculator. So they enter in, you know, mortgage, their, excuse me, their amount, and then their payment or interest rate. And then they add up all their other debts, you know, HELOC, boat payment, credit card, because the HELOCs are at 10%, credit cards are at 18 to 22%. So yeah, they may have a three, three and a half percent mortgage, but when they actually add up all these other debts, they have like mm -hmm. a 5.9% mm -hmm. interest on this combined debt. And then the right. third calculator is a new mortgage calculator. Because what I want them to do is rather than compare your old mortgage to a new mortgage and look at the gap, the difference in payment, let's take all your debt monthly payment, look at that and can pay off the debt at closing and then get yeah. a new mortgage. And now let's compare those two payments, your total debt payment to your new mortgage payment. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So that tool is on my website. And um, I, I sent out an email this morning. I don't know if you saw that or not, but um, and I'll be doing a demo on the Facebook group, Utah Agents. So oh. yeah, it's a powerful tool. I think, you know, it's designed to say, look, you know, I mean, I had this idea in my head for a few months and then the last few weeks I finally got it built, you know, to where, I... <clears throat> but anyway, so yeah, use that. I mean, have that, it's a way to start having conversations with your SOI, you know, even yeah. put in your, maybe an article for your newsletter, you know, are you stuck on your low mortgage, you know, type thing and say, have you considered the, the amount of debt you're actually working? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people didn't refinance their mortgage. They went out and got seconds and HELOCs. You know, right. and, and those seconds in HELOCs, every time the Fed raises the rate, they go up. Right. You know, so, you know, so that may be time. Anyway, just a thought. I'm pretty excited about that tool. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. So you do. So you do. An, uh, how often do you do new newsletter? Once a quarter? Is that what you said? Quarterly. Yep. Quarterly. Yeah. Okay. And then um, then you do a lot of Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I started yeah. Instagram. I'm, you know, I'm older. So mine was Facebook, right? So then mm -hmm. now I'm Instagram. So, yeah. So what kind of, what do you do? What do you kind of postings do you do on Instagram? So um, where I got my start on Instagram was with this segment that I did for years. It was called uh, Tuesdays in the twos. So every Tuesday I would go and film three houses under $300,000 in areas that you'd want to live. Um, and I, you know, walk through them and make cheeky comments about them and then post them. And it became kind of a thing. A lot of people were following it. Um, you know, <laughs> sometimes people comment, they're like, oh, you get so much business from Instagram, but you don't have that many followers. And I go, yeah, that's because the followers that actually follow me are actually real human people that are interested in my services. I don't right. have like a lot of bots. Right now I have a lot of realtors on there, which I don't love to be honest. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would do this Tuesdays in the twos and I'd be out skiing or at Home Depot and have people go, hey, Tuesdays in the twos. Um, That's pretty cool. Because I usually, I'm not wearing them right now, but I usually wear these red glasses. So I'm sort of more recognizable. Um, so yeah, I did Tuesdays in the twos forever. And obviously I can't do that anymore because we don't have any twos anymore um, or very <coughs> few. Uh, so I've gone through different segments. I did Thursdays in the threes. I did wacky house Wednesdays. Um, I did what's it cost Wednesdays. So it all always involves some, you know, me going out and filming homes for people and either working the numbers, how much are payments on this thing or just commenting on them or just having fun with it, seeing, you know, yeah. interesting homes, things like that. Um, so that's always been kind of the foundation. And then on the actual posts, you know, it'll be closings and new listings I've got or like quirky. My favorite is like, you know, a super retro house with like shag carpet and chain yeah. lights and wallpapers. And so people know me for like, you know, retro quirky house content, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, I used to do like with Snapchat filters, kind of funny readings of the more flowery 
listing descriptions, you know, that get a little bit poetic. Um, right. You know, just fun stuff like that. So I try to keep it like really real and authentic. I'm not like the, here's the luxury home that right. everybody wants. I'm not that, not that right. guy at all. Well, and so. people, people tend to gloss over that. You know, yeah, it's very generic. <laughs> well, like I, I wrote a white paper years ago. I called it, um, I'm telling you to violate the rules, right? And so we're like, and I gave the example. I was sitting in my, on my couch in my living room, you know, and I'm, I said, as I'm writing this article, you know, I have a laptop that had Dell, Windows, and Intel, right? So there's three pieces of advertisement sitting on the laptop on my desk. I have a phone next to me that has, you know, uh, at the time I think it was Motorola and Verizon. So there's two more ads. So right there, and then there was a camera, a digital camera back then. We didn't have the cameras on our phones. And then, um, you know, then it, you look over at my television, it has a brand name. And then it had the DVD player, it had a brand name, you know. So, you know, and this is just me and my straight vision in my safe space. Yeah. And then I gave the example. I said, what if you drove down Fort Union Boulevard where I live? It's the commercial district. You know, if you went from 2300 East all the way to the, to the freeway, you couldn't even count the number of signs. And if, if I sent five people down counting them, I'd get five different answers. So yeah. what we have done Pav in a Pavlovian way, we've conditioned ourselves to not even see that advertisement. Yeah. And so what, and so now violating the rules was the only, the only ad you remembered was the yellow sign nailed to a telephone pole, handwritten. It said, investor and apprentice want it. Right. <laughs> I mean, all that advertisement, you know, that was done professionally. The only one I remember was the black Sharpie on a yellow board, you know? So you're and saying so, it worked. Yeah. You saw my sign. No. Yeah. Right. But that, so you're, you're breaking the rules of what Madison Avenue says is correct. Right. So, I mean, that's exactly what you're doing is you're breaking those rules. Yeah. I feel like the, the look, like my website is a completely custom website. It's not like through Keller Williams, you know, a lot right. of the brokerages provide websites. Mine is completely custom. And if somebody, what I found is that if somebody follows me on Instagram for a period of time, or if somebody makes their way to my website, like I've had people just type in like realtor Salt Lake city. And strangely, I'm like number 12 or 13 on that list, right. which is crazy to me because there's 10,000 of us here. Right. But um, if somebody follows me on Instagram or makes their way to my website, I generally don't have to like interview for the position. Usually right. people feel like they know who they're they, signing yeah. up for, especially if they follow me because my videos are just me. Like half the time I'm in my pajamas with no makeup on, right. just talking about some real estate thing, you know? And so I, people generally like know what I'm about. Um, right. which I think is crucial. You know, I'm, I, I very rarely feel like I'm sort of interviewing for a position with folks. Right. Yeah. And that's the way it is now. And I think, I think a lot of agents and loan officers alike, um, kind of don't really get that, mm -hmm. you know, people are interviewing you. They're just not doing it across a desk, you know, yeah. they're, they're looking at you way before you get there, <laughs> you know, and I, and, and I've, I've taught that for years that, you know, your social media stuff matters, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, try to stay away from the politics if you can, you know. Well, and people can read through, I, I taught a class at Keller Williams just that was basically just how to be an authentic agent. I forget what we called it exactly. But, you know, the idea was people can read in a second if you're being authentic or not, right. or if you're, you know, BSing them. And like, my thing is like, when you get your license, figure out like who you are and what you are and what really matters to you and, and advertise that, you know, and people right. will see when you're being, if you're trying, you know, people who try to be luxury listing agents or try to be these different things are, people are going to see through that too, you know, right. and not that you can't, not that you can't. Um, that's something that I struggle with actually, is I think, Oh, I'm, I'm, I've always said I'm down on the ground with the real people. I'm helping like the real right. people buy houses and it's limiting for me, you know, cause I, I don't think of myself as that house on the Hill agent. Right. And I go, Oh, I'm not that luxury agent, but there's no reason that I can't work with people who have, you know, wild. Million and a half dollars, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I, I mean, I have, but. <laughs> right. Yeah. I have yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. They're no different. You know, 
and they and once they know and trust and like you so it's really a mindset you know yeah 100 percent. yeah you know so but um yeah so that's cool i mean so you know with the instagram um you know i'm kind of newer to instagram like i said i you know i mean a lot you know especially you know i mean i've been a broker and now a loan officer so a lot of my marketing is really real estate agents and so you know, with that said, I mean, I'm heavily involved in online marketing via the Utah Agents Facebook group. You right. know, you know, there's 5,600 members. You know, now I'm sure there's some of them are not agents anymore. You know, I vetted them on the way in. If their license expired, I mean, there's no way of figuring that out, you know. Sure. Yeah. You know, you have to export a list somehow. And I don't know if you can actually do that or not. And then go check them all with the division, which well, I'm Well, and there's, not there's do still... It there's still a source of potential leads and referrals anyway, even if they're not licensed. So. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that's true too. You know, so, but, um, but I find the ones that really aren't licensed anymore, they're just, they kind of dissipate. They just go away, you know, mm -hmm. but that's always been my, um, so I've been heavily involved in that, but, you know, uh, cause I, you know, at dawn, you know, <clears throat> you know years ago, it was like, well, wh what social media should you go on? I'm like, well, where, you know, my kids were, you know, like, the, I don't think of TikTok was really then yet, but it was mostly Instagram, I think, and Snapchat. <clears throat> I'm like, well, if that's where my kids are, well, I'm going to go over here because they don't have any money. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that was how I kind of, I took it, you know, and, you know, of course that was 10, 12 years ago. And, you know, that generation has now grown up. My daughter's now a real estate agent, you know, and does pretty well for herself, just bought a property in Michigan to rent out, you know. Yeah. So she's doing pretty good, you know, so, but, so then it's like, okay, maybe it's time I start gravitating into that space. You know? Well, and what's wild is I read this thing the other day that Gen Z's homeownership numbers are already higher than millennials. Um, and so I think people do kind of like poo poo the younger generation, like, oh, they're not going to buy houses. And you're like, actually they're buying houses. <laughs> like I, I just sold a couple 25 year olds, their right. first house, right. you know, and it's like, um, you know, I, more, the more I, it, it's funny, like the longer I'm in real estate, it's like my first time home buyers are seemingly getting younger. Right. You know, and then I'm also helping the folks that I helped buy their first home transfer into their next home. Right. Um, I'm regularly surprised. And in my world, I'm delusional. I think being like single and childless makes me just think I'm eternally youthful. And so <laughs> I'm always like whoever I'm working with, I'm like, oh yeah, we're like the same age. And then at the closing table, I see their ID and I go, oh my God, right. <laughs> I'm like 15 when? years older than you. <laughs> You're so, born um, in the 21st century. Holy crap. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm like regularly sort of like shocked at the closing table of like, oh, I'm actually not the same age as these people, but also like, <laughs> wow, congrats for buying a house when you're 26. That's incredible. Yeah. I'm looking at, I have five, five applications I'm working on and, the oldest one is 30. Yeah. You know? And the youngest yeah. one's 21. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, I haven't helped a 21 year old yet, but plenty of 26 year olds. I mean, I actually get excited when I'm on the phone with them, you know, I'm like, I am so excited to help you with, you know, I'm like, I am going to help you. I'm like, no question is too small to call me up and ask, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just take them under my wing, you know, and they love that, you know, cause that's, cause they're just full of questions. I'm like, look, half the stuff you're going to find online and read, I'm sure there's kernels of truth in there. But before you do anything, yeah. I'm like, you, you don't do any finance, don't do anything financially without calling me first. Yeah. So I just had a gal that's going to inherit $2,200, right? Not a large lump of money, but she called me up. Okay, I'm getting this money. How do I handle it? <laughs> like, just keep Good. a paper Good. trail of everything. That's all. You know, I always joke that we should all get neck tattoos that say, please don't take out any new lines of credit. Right. <laughs> well, isn't that the truth? <laughs> Lenders and realtors. Get to put the QR code on your forehead and say, here, scan this, <laughs> you know, the 10, yeah. the, the, the 10 commandments of, of loan application, you know, yeah, during a loan yeah. application. You know, yeah. you don't quit your job. No new credit. Yeah. No cash deposits, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The other one that comes up a lot is, you know, they're getting a gift from parents. I'm like, you know, it's better that to have the parents, you know, just wire the money straight to the title company right. rather than send it to the child and 
because then we had this, I mean, we can, it's not a big deal to verify, it, but it's a lot less work if they just send it to the, it's a lot less work for them if they just send it to the title company. Because you get the parents yeah. are like, well, we need to see a, a copy of your bank account. And they're like, well, I'm not giving you that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You know, and it's like, well, we're not going to close then, you know? Yeah. So that's always a, a battle. But oh, well. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. They are getting younger. So Gen Z, so Gen Z has a larger desire to buy than the millennials. And, and my theory on that is like the millennials grew up during the crash. Mm -hmm. And so that, cause I, my daughter even said that, you know, she's not a millennial. She's like a year or two younger than a millennial. And, um, you know, and I, when she was 18, I tried to get her to get her license. I'm like, get your license now, you know, <clears throat> and she would be eight, you know, she'll be 26. She'd be eight years into the business. And so, you know, and then a little while later, she confessed to me. She says, I never, she, as she saw me grow in my brokerage, you know, she's like, I never thought of real estate as a good business because, mm -hmm. you know, when I came of age, the market had crashed and, you know, she she saw the disaster side of it. I'm like, oh, sweetie, that is like, that's like a once in a generation, like event, you know, that doesn't yeah. happen often. You know, we go through cycles, but not that and that, you know. Right. And then she, you know, as I started growing my brokerage, she realized that, hey, maybe this is a good business. And she got her license a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was it was such a traumatic thing. I talked a little bit about that yesterday on the panel, you know, that people just have this vernacular that won't die, the bubble and the crash and the this right. and the that. And you're like, all of those things were caused by things that aren't things anymore, you know, right. and but people can't seem to get that. And I realize that's just trauma. That's just like an American trauma that just sticks with people. And they just right. think that's like how it always is, or that's always a possibility, or that's always right. how it's going to go. And and it's it's <clears throat> tough to break people out of that mindset, for sure. It takes like real therapy, I think. Right. Well, and it takes, it takes educating because, because all they remember, because the average person has no clue what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, they just know it crashed, but they have no clue right. why. You know, right. we didn't have a housing crisis. We had a financial crisis that led to a housing crisis. And we're mm -hmm. nowhere even close to a financial crisis <clears throat> because, you know, interest rates are higher. Um, you have to verify your income. You know, you have to prove um, the ability to repay. I mean, that's actually uh, uh, a rule in mortgage, the ability to repay, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, you have to prove it in your loan application. And so. And the other thing that happened during that time period is we had an abundance of inventory. I mean, we're not even close to that. I mean, we are, I mean, we're literally nationwide, like during the, when the market crashed, we had 4 million homes for sale. Mm -hmm. Now we have a, like a million, a million and a quarter. That's yeah. like, we're not even, I mean, if we doubled our inventory, we still wouldn't be like, we'd still be half of the crisis inventory. Yeah. And so, I mean, we could actually double our inventory and it wouldn't kill the market. It would be a nice, at, th at that point, it would be a nice, healthy market. Yeah. I like the healthy market better. You know, the, the boom up and the boom down, it's like, you know, they're just brutal. Well, and that's what yesterday somebody said, um, oh, the market's like, let's be real. The market's really hard right now. And I went, I don't know, man. I kind of feel like 2021 was harder. Like 2021, I was like, I mean, the COVID years really just like constantly stressed, not able to get away. Right. The trading house might pop up that minute. Like so many buyers, so, like just so much static and craziness and losing out on offers. And I mean, I'd rather have this hard than that hard, honestly. Right. And maybe I'll, I should like knock on wood or something like maybe I'll take that back at some point. But right. um, yeah, I don't know. To refer to any market as hard, you're like, I don't know. It's just different. There's challenges in every market, I feel right. like. And and I'm not one of those agents that's been doing it for 25 years. I can't even imagine, you know, right. going through all that change. I'm only eight years in, so. Well, and it's, you know, it's uh, different skill sets, you know. So like in 2021, there was no skill required to sell a listing. Mm -hmm. The skill was being a, a buyer's agent that, could get a buyer a home 
without making offers on 12 homes, just making offers on two or three. Yeah. That, that became a skill set. Yeah. And so where, you know, during the crash, the skill was selling a listing. You know, there was no yeah. skill to buy one. You know, so the skill sets change based on the condition of the market. And I, I don't consider, um, and in fact, there's a Gary Keller phrase, I believe, he says, there's no such thing as a good market or a bad market. There's just a buyer's market and a seller's market and a shift in between. It's yeah. just that, you know, because when, you know, when the market crashed, they're like, well, that's a bad market. I'm like, well, it's a bad market for a seller, but it wasn't yeah. a bad market for a buyer. And the same yeah. thing in 2021. I mean, it's a good market. Well, if you were a buyer, it was a terrible market. Yeah. You know, so I, I like them. And, and I think with that, it, it, it changes your mindset of good versus bad. You know, yeah. it's just it because it's not it, either one. One of them's always bad for the other. It's it's funny that you mentioned that because like so I always talk about my toolbox. I'm like, I have this toolbox as a realtor stays with me all the time, but the tools change all the time. You know, so the toolbox in 2021 look completely different than the toolbox right. today. Um, and it's funny because I. I've recognized recently that I can be a very black and white person, like good, bad, right, wrong, you know. Um, but it's funny because I'm not that way with real estate. I'm not, I have no semblance of like, yeah, a good market <clears throat> or a bad market. I just have like, I don't know, it's just a market. It's just right. how it is right now. And I, I love that it's either buyers or sellers or the transition in between, because that's definitely a thing that we've felt right. this year, maybe a couple times this year um, as it as it kind of, ebbs and flows, I guess. So. And the transitions are a lot faster than they used to be. You know, this when I year first... has been, yeah, wild. This year in particular, I feel like has been <clears throat> the quickest transitions and the, the most I've had to sort of like modify and evolve with the market. I've been any year I've been real, real estate. I'm constantly kind of, and that's why I go to a lot of masterminds, you know, talk to a lot of people because I just feel like we're just shape shifting like every two weeks. Right. Well, the, the last shift was, was interest rate related, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, I mean, if you think about it, rates really are not high historically. Right. We're like at a historical average. Mm -hmm. It's just that we went from, even lower. Yeah. I don't know what the average is anymore because we had such a long run of low rates that the average I'm sure had to come down some, but, the, um, what was I going to say? Where was it going with that? Oh, it had to do with, it's not so much where rates are, it's they got there so fast. Mm -hmm. So we weren't really dealing with high rates more as much as we were dealing with whiplash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just, they, they went, what? <laughs> you know? I mean, it was yeah. just, man, it was just, you know, <clears throat> brutal. And so, and also, too, that the fact that the prices went up so fast in 2021 and 2022. Mm -hmm. So when you compound that with the doubling of interest rates, you know, it just it just shocked people. Yeah. And I think it's starting to settle down. I think the shock is starting is starting to wear off. Yeah, no, I agree. <clears throat> yeah, I feel like the shifts like, yes, there was a big shift when interest rates changed. But the shifts that I've been referring to have been mindset shifts between buyers and sellers. You know, right. we had a bunch of sellers pull back and go, oh, you're not making as much as you were making six months ago. So I'm out. I'm not going to, I'm going to rent my house instead. You know, and then buyers going, oh, I can't be competitive and have high interest rates. And then going, oh, I don't have to be competitive. Now it's just a high interest rates. Okay, we can do that. You know, and and I, I've just, I feel like this year is the the most sort of like, indecisive people have been where they go, yeah, I want to do this. And they go, I don't know if I want to do it. Yeah, I want to do it. I don't know. You know, and usually I have people that are just like, let's go do this thing. And this year has been a lot more sort of like finessing how people are feeling right. about buying or selling their homes. Well, and the problem is, you know, they get, they just get bad information. Like even, yeah. I, I even saw like memes from a realtors association that were using, um, median home price to say that prices went down. And I'm like, well, median home price doesn't necessarily mean prices went down. 
And median home price is just simply the middle price. Mm -hmm. So if you had a hundred homes sell, well, the odds are great. There's going to be a higher price at one end and a lower price at the end or at the other end. So there's, the middle is going to probably, because you have high prices on the end or more of them, there's, the middle is going to move toward a higher side. You know, when mm -hmm. uh, the sales volume shrinks a little bit, well, the middle is going to be a lower number. But that doesn't mean equity disappeared. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's like, you know, and it's, you know, it's like you can't use median <clears throat> to uh, describe equity. It yeah. just means what houses are selling. So, is that, so, but so if realtor organizations are doing that, then, you know, the average guy on the street, I mean, they don't have a prayer to get in mm -hmm. quality information. I mean, the media is always painting a doom and gloom picture. You know, the yeah, market's going to crash. Yeah. And, you know, you know, they like to keep you in fear. <clears throat> you know, to, I mean, the government, I mean, their job right now, I mean, they got a, I don't envy the job of trying to get this inflation under control. Because, I mean, if, if rates were to go down, inflation would start over again. Mm -hmm. Because buyers would, because, you know, all the rates would go down, which means buyers would... Buyers of everything, right? Consumer yeah. goods would use more credit cards, buy more cars, buy more houses. That's just going to create inflation again. So to get yeah. them, they want to get inflation down to like 2%. And there's just going to be pain to get it there because we're like in the threes now. <clears throat> and then so anyway, it is what it is. Yeah. But I don't envy that position because how do you, because again, right now, if they, if they were to take their foot off the gas, inflation would start all over. Mm-hmm. And then we'd have bigger problems, <laughs> you know, for everyone across the board. So it, it's it's a challenging situation, you know. I wouldn't. I mean, they kind of created the mess, you know. Now they gotta, you know. It's funny how they create it and we suffer for it, right? It's like I don't know about mm -hmm. this. <clears throat> my yeah. next job, I want to be a, you know, I want to be a government, a taxing body. It's what I want to be in my next life, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to work. I just want to tax people, you know. So, <laughs> but anyway, um. Yeah, it's just interesting times, you know, so. Truly. So, but that's interesting. You were on a top producer panel and it was a lot of doom and gloom, huh? Well, I think it was like fighting back against the doom and gloom. Like oh, a lot of the questions and the attitude of the thing were like, hey, look at these guys doing great business. Like what's their mindset? What are their habits? What are the things they're doing? Like right. with the assumption that, you know, I think there were 80 or so people in the room with the assumption that like people were feeling a little down about the market. So it was like, cheer up, like everything. Yeah, right. Look at these guys, you know. Oh, I love this kind of shift in the market. When the market shifts, because here's, well, here's what I know what's going to happen. The agent and now loan officer population is going to walk around mumbling for a year. Yeah. And I'm like, and I, you know, I've been through these shifts m multiple times. and so. I'm like, okay, the market's shifting. Which way is it going? Um, what do we need to do to get in front of people that are buying and selling houses? Mm -hmm. It's that simple, you know? Yeah. Yeah, when the, when the, you know, when a shutdown happened and when the government shut the economy down, um, you know, the agents were freaking out. I mean, for a couple of weeks, I mean, the country just freaked out because nobody, I mean, we've never had that before. Well, the government said, okay, there's no more economy. It was like, what? <laughs> Yeah. You know, I mean, now what? I mean, that's we've never experienced that. And so what I was doing was when I had my brokerage, I was sending out a text message every day to my agents. You know, yesterday we had this number of new listings, this number of listings went under contract and this number of listings closed. There's people buying and selling every day. Get yeah. in there and get your share. And I did that for months you know, and kept, you know, and some of my agents buried their head in the sand and some of them had their best years ever. Yeah. You know, so the ones that, you know, listen to the idea that people are still moving, you know, they, they had their best years ever. So, yeah. you know, just go look in the MLS every day. How many sold yesterday? How many, you know, I mean, it's not a huge number when you do it daily. If you did it weekly, say every Monday morning, the first thing you did was log in the MLS and see how many new listings came on the market for the week, how many new pending sales for the week, and how many closed. You'd be like, hmm, you know, that's I got to get out there. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's just a little inspiring for that, you know. So, 
But you have the right mindset, though. And you have, and like you said, you have a mature database now that knows knows you like you. And they're also maturing at, the, like you said, their their life events are taking place. Yeah. So, anyway, <clears throat> well, let me ask you. So, is there anything I'm not asking you that we should be talking about? <laughs> um, I mean. I think uh, so. I gave a little uh, to to close it off. I'll give a little pearl of wisdom that I gave yesterday in the panel. Okay. They asked us like if you could talk to a room of agents and say like one thing that you could do to kind of like um, you know better your chances or better your career. And what I said is I had learned this um, quote recently that was your goals don't care about your motivation. Your goals care about your um, <laughs> I just I just blew my profound thought uh your right. consistency sorry so right. your goals don't care about your motivation they care about your consistency and so I think in my business um during times where I felt stress or I didn't have anything under contract I just always go okay what can I do this week and so this is why like having the Tuesdays and the twos as you know that happens on Tuesdays I can't do it on Wednesday I can't right. do it on Monday it happens on Tuesday and that has kept me sort of like grounded in real estate is like, just do the work. Because I hear a lot of agents go, oh, I wasn't motivated to make my calls today. I go, you don't need to be motivated. You just got to do it. Like right. you can make calls in your pajamas feeling like really down and out and still make the calls, you know? So right. I think it's just about like making sure that you're doing the work consistent, consistently. And when you do that, people see that. That's the other thing is like, you know, you can call everybody and say, oh, I got my realtor license. And they go, okay, cool. Yeah. Who doesn't have their realtor and then they license? Didn't, yeah, but they don't hear from you for a year. You know? Yeah. But if, you, if you're calling them regularly or you're sending an email regularly or you're online doing some, you know, new agents, I go, go look at houses. You can get a key and right. just go to vacant ones. Don't displace people, but go look at houses. Right. And then suddenly your Instagram is you and houses. So they go, oh, you must be doing the work as a realtor. Like right. as long as people are seeing you do something regularly, they're going to think that you're doing real estate full time. And then before you know it, you're actually going to be doing real estate full time. So right. that's my little like nugget yep. to people. Yeah. You have to be first, not you can't. It's kind of like um, people that say, I want to be rich. I'm like, well, you have to think like someone that makes a lot of money before you can. Have, you can't wait till you have a lot of money and start thinking like that. You have to think that way first. So the, then the thing when you start thinking that way, the same thing. If you start thinking like a full time real estate agent, you'll behave like a full time real estate agent. And next thing you know, voila. Well, it's a little different than that, because I think a lot of people think of themselves as full time real estate agents, but they're no. not doing the work to be. No, no. Real right. Estate well, agents. I, I'll grant you. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> You yeah. can think you can think you're a full time agent all day long, but if you don't do yeah. anything about it, you're not. So. Yeah, show me your activities, not your production. Exactly. Yeah, yeah Mike Ferry used to say, "God, these so many agents are like." He's like, "You might as well just get in. If you're not going to work, you might as well just get in a coffin and wait." <laughs> it's like that's what he used to say. Get get in a coffin and wait. So yeah. But anyway, well, that's great. Well, you know, um, that this has been awesome. So. Thank you so much. I really got, you know, I enjoy getting to know people. I didn't know about your like mountain person, um, you know, uh, background and stuff like that. So that's really cool to learn, you know? So anyway, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. Thanks. So again, Annie Trujillo from Keller Williams, top producing agent, uh, sharing her story. And again, my name is Rob Aubrey. I'm the host here of productive age, or yeah, productive agent podcast. Is, and it's sponsored by Aubrey Home Loans. Thanks and have an amazing day.